You're the reason mom took her own life. I want a divorce right now. I was dumbfounded when I suddenly received an angry call from my husband while having lunch outside. Actually, I'm having lunch with your mother right now? What? My husband said so and immediately hung up. Puzzled about why he said such a thing, I tilted my head in confusion along with my mother-in-law. However, after learning his motives, I decided to stand up and thoroughly confront him. My name is Mary, and I'm 28 years old. I've been married to my husband Daniel, who's two years my senior, for three years now. While supporting my husband who works as a company president, I also started working from home to help with the household finances. But it seems Daniel wasn't too happy about me working. You don't need to work, you know. That wasn't a word of appreciation for me trying to balance housework and a job. It'll look like I'm not earning enough if my wife has to work. I was disappointed with my husband who cared only about his own appearance. But to that, I was often uplifted by my mother-in-law, Susan. It's commendable that you're working from home on your own terms. And, she often invited me out for lunch. I loved Susan, and despite how I felt about my husband, I was content with my life. Maybe I've been too lenient with Daniel. One day, while chatting in a cafe with Susan, she sighed. I spoiled him as an only child, but lately, he's been asking for money frequently, he says it's for the company, but it seems suspicious. I had no idea, Daniel never mentioned anything like that to me. But knowing my husband who likes to show off, even if the company was in trouble, he probably wouldn't tell me until it was too late. I sometimes regret how I raised my child. I worry if I've been a burden to you, Mary, and it keeps me up at night. Susan, you've done nothing wrong. No matter how hard you try in parenting, it ultimately depends on the child. I might not be convincing since I don't have any kids, but... No, Mary, I feel so relieved that you're trying to cheer me up. Thank you, as always. Seeing Susan's gentle smile, I strongly felt that no matter what happens, I'll always stand by her side. Perhaps disliking my connection with Susan, my husband gradually started to harass me more. What's with today's lunch? Strawberry jam on a sandwich? What? Isn't it your favorite? I only accept blueberry jam. Strawberry is too common and poor looking for my taste. Daniel came home, yelling, and threw the lunchbox into the trash can. How could you? That lunchbox is getting old too. Buy a new one, will you? As he stomped into his room, a sweet perfume scent wafted from him. Daniel, you've been wearing that scent a lot lately. However, when I cleaned his room, there was no perfume bottle, and I suspected it might be a woman's fragrance. And then, without any notice, he started coming home late more frequently. Hey, I put extra effort into dinner today and waited for you, didn't you get my message? Yeah, I know. But no matter how hard you try, your cooking can't beat a one-star hotel's. What? Did you eat out on purpose? Daniel, you've been acting strange lately. What? Shut up. Move, you're in the way. He shouted, pushing me aside and walking to the bathroom. That's when I caught that perfume scent again. I don't want to think about it, but it's clearly a sign of cheating. I was restless, and soon Daniel even started badmouthing Susan. That old lady, she should just give me the money without lecturing. Acting all high and mighty. Look who's talking. How can you ask Susan for money? That's none of your business. He seemed irritated and kicked the trash can to intimidate me. And usually, wives and mother-in-laws don't get along. It's not supposed to be that way. But Susan is such a good person. I have no reason to dislike her. My husband clicked his tongue in annoyance at my response. Then, Daniel started badgering me about Susan. Mom was complaining about you again. Says she hates going out with you because you're an inconsiderate daughter-in-law. No way. Susan would never say that. Considering my relationship with Susan so far, I couldn't believe Daniel's words. You really are naive. 
Why would she reveal her true feelings to a daughter-in-law like you? She's just been tolerating you. Watching my husband's exasperated expression, I began to worry if it might be true. Moreover, he told me Susan didn't want to see me and asked me not to contact her. I intended to trust Susan, but I thought it best to lay low for a while. Oh, right. Mom asked me to give you something. What is it? But when I looked inside the box Daniel handed me, it was rotten and emitted a terrible smell. I grimaced. The expiration date on the back was a month old. They were perishables. Wow, this is bad. Mom really hates you, doesn't she? My husband looked maliciously pleased. During this time, the perfume scent only grew stronger, and I endured a hellish three months. One day, unable to bear it anymore, I decided to call Susan. Tomorrow, I'll finish work by noon. Would you like to meet up? I'd like to have lunch and talk a bit. Yes, that's fine, but are you sure you want to see me? What do you mean? I only understood the meaning behind Susan's words when we met the next day in a private room at a restaurant. It turns out my husband had also lied to Susan, telling her I'd been speaking ill of her. Of course, the story about Susan complaining about me was also a lie by my husband. I thought so too. But I was worried, maybe it was true. These past three months have felt like I was dead inside. I also thought there's no way you would say such things, but just in case it was true, I was avoiding going out with you. So what's with the rotten perishables? What? What are you talking about? Seeing Susan tilt her head in confusion, I realized that was also a lie by Daniel. While Susan and I, feeling distrustful towards Daniel, were discussing our next steps over lunch, my phone rang. Huh? It's Daniel. I excused myself to Susan and answered the call, only to be yelled at by my husband. It's your fault! What? Why are you yelling at me all of a sudden? You bullied mom into taking her own life. I want a divorce from you right now. Confused by Daniel's words, I was stunned. Actually, I'm having lunch with your mother right now. What? Surprised, my husband immediately hung up. What was that about? What happened? Before we could even ponder, Susan received a call. Hello? Oh, Daniel? What's up? Susan quickly switched her phone to speaker mode. On the other end, my husband's voice lowered, as if he was trying to find out something. Mom. Are you with someone right now? To that Susan winked at me and responded. Oh, I'm just out shopping with a friend. Is something wrong? Hearing this, my husband muttered. She lied, that liar. Then, he blurted out something outrageous. Mary is cheating. You know what? I'm divorcing her, so you must never trust her again. What? I gestured to Susan to keep talking. Quietly nodding, she pretended to be fooled and continued to draw out my husband's motives. Finally, the reason behind Daniel's suspicious behavior became clear. After ending the call with my husband, Susan's face looked devilish. I was filled with anger too. Susan, let's teach that man a lesson together. When I got home, my husband was already there. Oh, you're home early today. Yeah. Despite his inner tension, Daniel's attempt to appear calm was almost comical. But I decided to take the initiative. Today, I got a weird call around noon. It might be my imagination, but the voice sounded like yours. Is it some new scam or something? What? Really? Be careful not to get fooled, okay? Hearing my words, my husband seemed relieved, thinking he'd gotten away with it, and reverted to his usual demeanor. Where were you anyways? If you're a housewife, you should act like one and stick to house chores. Okay, I hear you. Then the doorbell rang. I'm doing the dishes, could you get the door, Daniel? Fine. Reluctantly, he opened the door and I heard him scream. Standing there was Susan and another young woman. Emily! What are you doing here? Oh, 
I just invited your new bride over as a mother. She's young and cute, isn't she? Mom, don't say anything. Daniel gestured for Susan to be quiet, but I watched from behind with a cold gaze. I'm sorry to say this, but both Susan and I know about your affair. I watched Daniel gasp. Please, come in. He welcomed the woman named Emily. How long have you known? Sitting across from us, Daniel looked up with a fearful gaze. Daniel, every time you came home, you smelled of perfume. Didn't you notice? Or is there something wrong with your nose? Tired of feeling uneasy, I decided to investigate my husband's mistress. Disguising my hair and outfit, I frequented a cafe near his office and followed him and his mistress to a hotel, capturing the moment they entered. I was so excited that I couldn't sleep that night. How did you find her contact information? You thought you were careful by setting your phone's lock to fingerprint recognition, but that's easy to bypass when you're asleep. Don't I have any privacy? Be quiet. Susan, usually calm and gentle, raised her voice, silencing her son. So, I contacted Emily, and Susan went to pick her up. I forced my husband's chin up as he sat with his head down. He couldn't move, just looking into my eyes. You mentioned your intentions over the phone to Susan, but could you share them with me too? I intended to smile, but perhaps my eyes weren't smiling, as my husband trembled. Reluctantly, he began to explain his suspicious behavior and the purpose of his call that day. I plan to divorce you, take the alimony and shared property, and then remarry Emily. So, initially, you intended to make it look like Susan took her own life and blame me for it, leading to a divorce. Is that correct? He nodded in small movements. It's surprising he thought such a lie about Susan's death would work. I guess he was that into his mistress. But when I told him I was having lunch with Susan, he was so caught off guard that he hung up the phone in shock. Still unrepentant, my husband, thinking of his next move, quickly contacted Susan. When Daniel came to me with his plan, I was utterly disappointed. Susan pretended to be deceived and extracted the story from him. Mary cheated, so I'll take the compensation money and the shared property. That's what he told Susan. And he added the following. I've already found a new partner to marry as soon as we divorce. That partner turned out to be Emily, now sitting in front of us, pale-faced. Why won't you take my side? What do you mean? You always supported me. In elementary school, you always defended me when I did something wrong. But you changed ever since I married Mary. How far back are you living in the past? And I regret spoiling you too much when you were young. Daniel thought that his mother had changed because of me and had been lying to both of us so we wouldn't see each other. Disappointed with her son, Susan sighed deeply. I never thought you could be so selfish. I'll end it here. I'm cutting off your financial support. What? You're kidding, right? Actually, Susan had been financially supporting Daniel's company, and his success as a president was largely due to her. However, after becoming suspicious of his constant requests for money, Susan discovered he was using the funds for his mistress and not the company. I no longer consider you my son. I'm disowning you, so leave this house. Daniel's face turned increasingly pale. It was only natural, since the house we lived in was in Susan's name, and he had always relied on his mother. Seeing him look at me in panic, I pushed the divorce papers towards him. Sign here, please. Here's a pen. Enjoy your life with your mistress as much as you want. At least let me off the compensation money. Don't joke with me. How dare you claim Susan took her own life? I said so and slapped his face. What? If there's no money, there's no benefit to marrying an old man like you. The mistress said so and slapped his face too. Daniel, holding his face, teared up and collapsed on the floor. By the way, Emily. I'll be seeking compensation from you too. What? Why me? You can't just meddle with someone's husband and get away scot-free. But. 
she too slumped powerlessly to the floor, and together, Susan and I kicked both the Daniel and Emily out into the cold. After divorcing my husband, I demanded $20,000 in compensation. He was kicked out of the house owned by Susan, his financial support was cut off, and his company went bankrupt. Now homeless and penniless, Daniel is apparently living on the streets. Of course, I also got $10,000 in compensation from the mistress. Susan and I remain close, and after my divorce, I moved in with her. Our bond deepened even more. And we now live freely and happily together, just the two of us. I will be erased soon. A letter from my sister-in-law Elizabeth, who had taken her own life, arrived addressed to me. It came a week after she had passed to the other side. Despite her will already being found, what on earth was going on? I couldn't understand at all. But when I saw that letter, my hands started shaking with anger. This can't be forgiven. The letter ended with the words, report to police immediately. Little did I know what would happen next. My name is Jessica, I'm 28 years old. I live with my husband Paul, who is five years older than me. Both of us worked at different companies. Paul had a sister named Elizabeth, a very gentle person who and for me who had no sisters, was like a real sister. And Elizabeth treated me like a sister as well. My sister-in-law was unmarried and said she had no boyfriend, but she confided in me alone. Actually, there's someone I've been interested in lately. He's a wrestler and is very strong. Elizabeth said with a happy smile. And this was a secret kept between just us. My father-in-law was a practicing doctor, but passed away due to illness three months ago, and after that, Elizabeth started living with my mother-in-law. But then, my mother-in-law also passed to the other side. The cause was due to an overdose of medication. Likely obtained from my father-in-law's clinic. After my father-in-law passed away, they were considering closing the clinic since my parents-in-law were known as a loving couple to everyone. The will created on the computer mentioned my mother-in-law couldn't bear my father-in-law's death. But my mother-in-law was a person who always enjoyed writing and had a beautiful handwriting as well. So I felt it was odd that her last message to this world wasn't handwritten. But my husband simply accepted it. She chose to go to the other side, so it's not strange she did something different. She must have been that lonely. Indeed, thinking of my mother-in-law's immense sorrow for the love of my father-in-law, I oddly found myself agreeing with Paul. But, amidst such interference, there was a mountain of things left to do. Because my mother-in-law had hardly touched anything inherited from my father-in-law, she had left behind a vast fortune. Paul would find time to immerse himself in the inheritance procedures. In contrast, my sister-in-law began sorting through my mother-in-law's belongings, one by one. And from this time, I started to notice a change in Paul's behavior. When he's home, he would stay in his room and when he had work, he would come home late. And then finally, he started frequently coming home in the morning without telling me at all. You've been acting strange lately. What on earth are you doing? It's none of your business. But... Your mother just passed away, and you're not coming home until morning. Shut up! Don't preach to me! My husband stormed out the door and became unreachable, not returning until the next evening. Given the gravity of our marital crisis, I confided in my sister-in-law about the situation with him. I'll subtly ask Paul what's been happening. Let's work together and resolve this. Her encouragement somehow bolstered my spirits. Yet, what followed was unimaginable. The very next day, my sister-in-law suddenly left this world. The cause was the same as my mother-in-law's, an overdose. And she too had left a note. I will join my beloved mother on her journey. But the idea that Elizabeth, who had been so positive just days before, taking her own life made no sense to me. Something is definitely wrong. Let's get the police to investigate. Making a fuss won't bring Elizabeth back. You just do what you're supposed to do quietly. Despite my inability to accept, the funeral wouldn't wait. With a heart full of sorrow and unresolved feelings, I proceeded to make the arrangements. 
After Elizabeth's funeral, exactly one week later, I was set to return to work. Arriving at the office, there was an envelope on my desk. It seemed to have arrived while I was away. Who could it be from? What? This can't be. I was shocked to see the sender's name. It was a letter from Elizabeth, who had passed away. Panicked, I opened it. I will be erased soon. Report to the police immediately. This sentence caught my eye. And as I continued to read, my hands began to tremble. The hidden truth! I can't believe this! Gradually, I felt a strong anger building inside me, my head heating up. Reflecting on everything that had happened, I resolved to put an end to it myself. But, I still lacked the crucial piece to do so. Thus, I sent a letter to someone, quietly waiting for the right time. Two nights later, I visited my parents-in-law's home and hid myself. Then, a dark figure quietly entered my sister-in-law's room. I followed the dark figure and then turned on the light. It's so bright! The person rummaging through Elizabeth's desk was none other than my husband, Paul. What are you doing here? And in the dark, too. It's as if you're searching for something, hoping not to be found. Don't say something stupid. What are you doing here yourself? As if I was the one doing something wrong, he pointed his finger at me. Ignoring my husband, I pulled out something I had prepared from my bag. Did you happen to read this letter? It was a letter I had written, pretending to be my sister-in-law, addressed to myself to arrive at our house. It read, Inside my desk, there is evidence of my brother's crime. Jessica, take this and report to the police. I had anticipated my quick-thinking husband would guess a letter from my sister-in-law contained something serious and would read it without permission. Seeing this, you came to destroy the evidence, but unfortunately, what's written here was a fake I created to lure you in. What are you talking about? I was just cleaning up. Really? Then can you say the same after seeing this? I took out the letter I had received from my sister-in-law a few days ago. Elizabeth knew you were responsible for sending your mother to the other side. That's why she pressured you to turn yourself in, right? But you took care of her too. Hearing these words, my husband instantly turned his face away. I pressed on, presenting the content of the letter to Paul. While sorting through things, Elizabeth found your mother's diary. It seems to say you jumped on some shady investment. So what? That's something I have no recollection of. Lies. It's all written here. I took out the diary my sister-in-law had enclosed in the letter. According to it, Paul had been pestering her to invest the family's fortune. Despite her refusals, he was persistent, causing her great distress. Unable to confide in anyone, my mother-in-law poured her anguished heart into the diary. Look here! As long as I'm in my right mind, I'll never let the fortune my husband left to be used for such dubious purposes. I want to live long, for the both of us. It says so, right? So what if it does? The evidence here made Elizabeth realize you must have been the one to end your mother's life. However, no matter how much my Elizabeth searched, she couldn't find definitive proof you sent my mother-in-law to the other side. As a last resort, Elizabeth tried to get a confession out of Paul. But my sister-in-law thought, being capable of such acts towards his own mother, he might not spare her either. If anything happened to her, she entrusted me through the letter to report my husband to the police. Hey, all of that is just made-up stories. After all, there's no conclusive evidence I sent those two to the other side, is there? You rummaging through Elizabeth's belongings right now is evidence enough. Calm down, will you? Saying this, my husband left the room and returned with coffee he had brewed in the kitchen. Here, drink this and calm down. Paul offered the coffee with a nonchalant demeanor. But this was exactly my aim. Surely you've mixed something strange in large amounts in this. Indeed, no decisive evidence of his crimes was found as my husband said. However, it was almost certain Paul was responsible for their deaths. And the deciding factor for my mother-in-law and sister-in-law's journey to the other side was medication. 
I figured if I made enough noise, you'd surely try to do the same to me too. If you handed me a drink or something, I thought it would surely contain something suspicious, becoming irrefutable evidence. My husband, clearly unsettled by my deductions, clicked his tongue. Basically, you jumped at that get-rich-quick scheme because you were squandering money on a woman, right? I had long suspected our marriage had grown cold and wondered if Paul was having an affair. Since a lot had been going on regarding my mother-in-law and sister-in-law, I had left it alone, but now I decided to thoroughly investigate Paul's background. Then, I found an unknown credit card in his room and discovered a history of purchases of expensive women's brand items on the statement. And, I found this as well. I pulled out a club hostess's business card I found in the inner pocket of his suit. I went to the club and met the woman named on this card. What? You met Nancy? Since she wasn't looking for any trouble, she told me everything just like that. She said you two were already in a relationship. According to Nancy, Paul was the one who persistently approached her. However, for her, Paul was just a good target, entering into the relationship only to get money from him. Knowing Paul was married, Nancy demanded compensation from him, which he complied with. But, she's been feeling bothered by you for a while. She said she was going to change clubs to cut ties with you. Too bad. What? But, I spent so much on her. Tears welled up in Paul's eyes as he hung his head. Paul infatuated with another woman was now depressed because his affair partner dumped him. How dare you act like this in front of your wife? I couldn't help but feel another wave of anger. Then suddenly, Paul lunged at me. Give me the coffee. He tried to snatch the coffee, which likely contained a large amount of medication and could serve as evidence of his crime. Stop it. Let go. Just give it to me. I struggled fiercely, but the difference in strength meant it was only a matter of time before the evidence ended up in his hands. But then, someone intervened to help. Get your hands off her! Easily knocking Paul down and pinning him to the floor. Who on earth are you? He's Richard, the man Elizabeth loved. He worked at the same place as my sister-in-law and had attended Elizabeth's funeral. Before Elizabeth passed away, she had mentioned about Richard. There's a wonderful man with a wrestling background. Seeing Richard, a solidly built man, holding back tears in front of Elizabeth lying in peace, I instantly knew he was the man my sister-in-law had loved. Approaching him, he opened up about his feelings for Elizabeth. Richard, too, couldn't believe my sister-in-law had taken her own life and we exchanged contact information, promising to share any new information. In order to carry out this plan, I had asked him to hide just in case. Damn it! You tricked me! My husband struggled, and with my help, the two of us managed to subdue him. Thinking he couldn't escape, Paul suddenly changed his tune. Look, Richard, can't we talk this out? If you let me go now, I might even share a bit of my family's wealth with you. You open your mouth and that's what you suggest? Jessica, you too. You know your husband could be criticized by society. Appalling. Did you really think I'd stay by your side for life? You really are full of yourself. You and I are over. When I mentioned breaking up, my husband's face turned pale. What? I'm going to be abandoned by my wife and get locked up? No, no, I don't want that. Paul struggled fiercely again, but Richard restrained him. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Never. You took the lives of your own mother and sister. Thinking of the two who had gone to heaven, I couldn't let Paul get away with this. I clenched my fists and glared at my husband. You're the worst kind of human being. I will never forgive you, Paul. Serve your time quietly behind bars. Just be prepared never to see the outside world again. My life is over. Crying out, my husband was immobilized by me and Richard. We then called the police, and soon after, officers arrived and took him away. Paul was later interrogated and seems to have confessed. A large amount of medication was detected in the coffee, sealing his fate. 
Aware of the severity of his crimes, he seemed to have resigned himself to his fate, losing all energy in life. As for myself, I divorced Paul and demanded a compensation of $30,000 from him and $10,000 from Nancy. And as for Richard, he said he is going to move on with his life. After all the procedures were completed, I moved to a new home, ready for a fresh start. I've been assigned new tasks at work and despite the challenges, I feel the most fulfilled I've ever been.